The villain is the engine of the story. They are the one that pushes the hero forward, forcing them to deal with obstacles that will change them. Well, how do you create a villain that is memorable? In this video, we'll take seven iconic villains to illustrate seven ideas on how to make a great villain. We have Ramsey Bolton, the Joker, Thanos, Darth Vader, Destro from G.I. Joe, Hans Landa from Inglorious Bastards, and the last one is a surprise. Number one, make us hate them. Ramsey Bolton is one of the most evil, vile characters I have ever seen in a movie. Other reviewers have claimed he's not a well-written character because he's not complex. I call bullshit. Truth is, monsters like Ramsey exist in real life and always have. The lack of complexity comes from their psychology being so warped. An idea has gone around suggesting that a complex villain is a great villain, but this isn't always the case. Complexity isn't always good for a movie. Take Kylo Ren. He's a good character, but he's a crap villain. Good character, crap villain because he is so sympathetic, he's barely a villain at all. And he's such a baby, he's not much of a threat. I mean, who could be afraid of a man who throws a hissy fit every five minutes? Let's take a not so complex villain, Game of Thrones' Ramsay Bolton. Now, Ramsay Bolton was such a great villain because I desperately wanted him to die. That's all he has to do. He is so horrifically evil that he creates an anxiety in the audience, a desperate wish to see him destroyed. And this can be just as, if not more, effective than creating a complex, nuanced character. But in order to do this, you have to be really cruel to your audience. It is not enough to give the cliched scene where your villain offs one of his underlings. Don't do that. It's such a cliche. They need to be really evil. And if you achieve that level of evil, give them a scene where they do something so awful that you want to watch them die. will squirm with pleasure when they finally get what's coming to them. Number two, make them better than the hero. Hans Landa is one of the great movie villains. Tarantino pulls influences from detective stories to give us a horrific version of Sherlock Holmes. But he has this pipe. And uh, so I wrote that in the script. And then I actually had a couple of more moments where I had Landa take out the pipe and like, you know, smoke and think. And so it was obvious it was Landa's pipe. But uh, I started thinking about it more and more as pre-production was going on and I had dinner with Kristoff and I asked him, I go, let me ask you a question. In the script, it's, you know, it's, it implies that this is definitely Londa's pipe and he uses it to think. Uh, but let me ask you a question. What if Londa doesn't smoke a pipe? He knows the farmer smokes a pipe. And so at a certain point, he brings out this pipe. And what pipe does he bring out? He brings out the Sherlock Holmes pipe. One, you can say it's a sexual thing because my pipe is bigger than yours. All right. And the other thing, you can say, I know you're lying and I got you. I've got the Sherlock Holmes pipe. You know, so maybe he doesn't smoke a pipe at all. It's simply just an interrogation technique to throw the farmer, uh, you know, send him more to hell. What makes Hans such an incredible villain is how much smarter he is than the heroes. <laughs> That's what makes him so effective. He's smarter and more capable. Take this scene here. Shoshana finds herself sitting down to lunch with a man who orchestrated the murder of her family. What makes this scene so suspenseful Shoshana is sure she will be caught because she knows the man sitting across from her is brilliant and loves to toy with his victims. She has to wonder, is he acting innocently or does he know who I am? In the end, the villain is so powerful, he seems like he may escape retribution. And that makes it all the more satisfying when he doesn't. Number three, give them their own hero's journey. Thanos is one of the most ingenious villains in any medium. The first time we see him in action, he takes down the Hulk in seconds. This is a strong way to introduce us to a character. Right away we have him go against the most powerful character the heroes have to offer, and he takes him down like he's nothing. This brings up an idea about storytelling that I think is really useful. Instead of thinking of character qualities as a way to establish their character, think of scenes. For example, we don't hear that Thanos is powerful, we are shown it in a scene where he beats the shit out of the Hulk. Qualities are not easily communicated to audiences, but scenes show us who they are. Anyway, back to Thanos. Thanos' story follows the hero's journey in inverse. In the hero's journey, there is a sickness in the world, and the hero takes on a task and goes on a journey to transform the world and themselves. The world is sick, according to Thanos. Too many people or life forms for it to sustain. So Thanos searches to complete the Infinity Gauntlet to solve the problem. 
In the hero's journey, the hero reaches a stage of transformation in which they must make a choice that determines who they are. Thanos chooses to kill his daughter, ultimately dooming him to become a tragic hero. We see Thanos' hero's journey in Endgame, but often the hero's journey for a villain is off-screen, but it can be powerful for the writer to imagine the story from the villain's perspective, imagining them with a goal they believe in and outline the steps they take to get it. Number four, make them the shadow. A great villain often occupies the space of the shadow. Darth Vader is Luke's shadow. The shadow is something Carl Jung talks about as a psychological concept, and the works of Carl Jung often match up with how modern movies are constructed. In shadow work, the patient is pushed to go where they are uncomfortable and face the opposite. The shadow is the dark reflection of the hero. This is why the villain and the hero often are alike in more ways than they are different. They may look different, they may in fact look the opposite, but they share the same flaw or lie that controls them. This is why the cliched scene in movies always shows up where the villain says, you and I are a lot alike, and the hero replies, no we're not. Truth is, yes they are. They look the opposite so that it fools the hero into thinking they are different. The hero cannot see their flaw, or the movie would be over. Just like in life, we can't accept or understand our flaws or the lies that hold us back. But eventually, the story will force us to face that flaw. Look at this scene from The Empire Strikes Back. Luke enters into the swamp of Dagobah, and he meets Vader. They cross lightsabers. Luke cuts off Vader's head. The head falls off. The faceplate explodes and shows Luke's face. Luke sees himself. Vader is his shadow. Luke denies this later on when Vader reveals he is his father. Luke says, no, this is impossible. But a movie later, Luke is in all black. He's got a robot hand. He's acting like his father. He's become his father. If you do not face your shadow, you will become it. And this allows the villain to become a vehicle of the theme. It is said that you can find the theme of a story by looking at how a character is unlike their mentor and is like their shadow. You look at the moment when Luke walks into the swamp in Dagobah. Yoda tells him, do not take your lightsaber. You will not need it. Your weapons, you will not need them. But Luke takes it anyway. He's angry. He is ready to fight. He is like his father. He is unlike his mentor, Yoda, and he is like his father. In the end, in Return of the Jedi, Luke has the opportunity to kill his father. He fights him. He knocks him down. He cuts off his hand, and he is ready to kill him. He is full of rage. He has become his father. And the Emperor tells him, kill him, kill him, kill him. But Luke looks at his hand. He looks at himself, he realizes, oh my God, I've become my father. I'm wearing all black. I've got a robot hand. He tosses his lightsaber away, reflecting that earlier moment in which Yoda told him he would not need it. This is how he defeats the emperor. The shadow is the personification of the character's flaw and a vehicle for theme. Number five, make them lovable. A villain doesn't have to be all bad. Villains can be attractive. We're attracted to them the way we might be attracted to a relationship that's bad for us. We know it's not right, but it just feels good. A character that works this way is Destro from G.I. Joe. And if you're not that familiar with the character or only know the cartoon, this is the character from the comic book. The comic book Destro is one of the best written villains I've ever encountered. If you are interested in G.I. Joe, I talk more about it on my other channel dedicated to 80s toys and cartoons. Check it out here. What makes Destro so compelling is he is not entirely evil. He's just out for himself. He's greedy and his moral code does not fit with the moral code of society. He occasionally will find that he is more aligned with the heroes and goes against Cobra Commander when his moral line is crossed. The key here, although he is a bad guy, he is a war profiteer, he is a criminal, he is also capable of good. This unpredictability makes him interesting. Other stories have used this example of a villain who occasionally switches sides. This was done to great effect in John Wick 4, where Donnie Yen's Kane operates in a similar way, both opposing the hero and occasionally helping him. The unpredictability of the villain makes them exciting to watch, as we don't know what they will do next, and we're not sure who we are rooting for. 
Key to this is to give the villains something that makes them sympathetic. For one, Destro is in love with the Baroness and will die to protect her. By giving them something to love, we begin to feel they can't be all that bad. Again, a similar idea was used in the Daredevil Netflix show with the Kingpin. He's a murderous monster, but his love for his woman makes him sympathetic and complex. Destro also has a code of honor. His morals are not ours, but he is a bad guy, sure, but he does have a code. And we relate to that. We relate to this idea of, I don't want to necessarily follow the morals of society. I want my own code. This creates the feel of a toxic relationship we have with this kind of character. We know they're bad for us, but we can't help but love them anyway. Number six, make them tragic. A villain is often a hero that has gone through their own journey and fallen. The tragedy of the Joker is amplified in Joaquin Phoenix's portrayal, although the Joker has always had an air of tragedy. In Alan Moore's The Killing Joke, after the Joker commits his most horrific acts ever, paralyzing Commissioner Gordon's daughter, we realize he is mentally ill and deeply sick and that he wasn't always that way. He tells a joke to the Batman. It's funny, this situation It reminds me of a joke. See, there are these two guys in a lunatic asylum, and one night, one night, they decide they don't like living in the asylum anymore. They decide they're going to escape. So, like, they get up onto the roof, and there, just across the narrow gap, they see the rooftops of the town stretching away in the moonlight, stretching away to freedom. Now, the first guy, he jumps right across with no problem, but his friend, his friend daren't make the leap, you see? You see, he's afraid of falling. So then the first guy has an idea. He says, hey... I have my flashlight with me. I'll shine it across the gap between the buildings. You can walk along the beam and join me. But, but, but the second guy just shakes his head. He says, says, he says, what do you think, I'm crazy? You'd turn it off when I was halfway across. They both start to laugh. The Joker is mad, but he wants a way out. But there's no way out for him. He's too far gone. The power of making your villain tragic is the audience can imagine and fear their own downfall into tragedy. The villain is a hero who struggled with their fatal flaw and lost, and there's no going back. The villain lives in the third act of a tragedy. They're doomed. Number seven, put your villain right next to the hero. The last tip is the villain of The Big Lebowski, and if you know the movie, the answer might surprise you. Walter is the villain of The Big Lebowski. Sure, you have the Nihilists and Jackie Treehorn and The Big Lebowski himself, but if the villain is the engine of the story, then no one fuels more of the conflict or does more damage than Walter. And this is the tip number seven. Number seven, keep your enemies close. The enemy doesn't have to look like the enemy. Some of the most effective villains of all time are side by side with the characters all along the way. This keeps the conflict close. He gives them the bad advice that leads him into a path of self-destruction. He's also in a way the bad mentor. When the dude's rug first gets pissed on, he just wants to vent. But Walter insists, you can't let this go, dude. You must rage against the world. Walter is the dude's shadow. He's the personification of that little part of the dude that can't abide. By following this ugly part of himself, he destroys everything in his life. Just watch this scene here. A boy has stolen the dude's car and possibly stolen the money from them. Walter and the dude show up at the kid's house and this is what happens. Walter flips out and threatens to bash in the kid's car, screaming, this is what happens when you F a stranger in the ass. Walter, thinking the kid has stolen from him, bashes the kid's car until he realizes it isn't even the kid's car. Walter is the opposite of the dude. If the dude abides, Walter rages against every little injustice with horrible consequences. But the dude can't see he shares a little of this deep inside him. Until in the end, he fights back and casts his villain aside. Villains come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. They can look the opposite of us or be our reflection. If you want to see more about the villain and how a great villain can affect your scenes, check out this video on how to write a great scene using Inglorious Bastards.